Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm very excited to be not only having a uh, three-person episode, myself included, two awesome guests, but also it's about Orange County drums and percussion, which is kind of an elusive episode that's been hard to book, but I've had some help from uh, my friends here who are joining me today. We have Mr. Michael Kelly, who was a very early employee of the company, uh, worked there for a long time. So Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, Jared Fallon, who has been, we, he and I have been talking for a long time on social media about making this episode happen, and he's been a good fan and supporter of the podcast. So Jared, welcome on. Thank you. Yeah. And Jared, so I, I will say you yourself are a collector and restorer and really an OCDP fanatic, uh, which is awesome. So you're you're a good man to have on this show as well. And I think- <laughs> Thank you. The way we'll handle this, again, because I think having both you guys on is awesome with some different perspectives. We'll talk to Michael a little bit more about the beginning of the company because he was there. And then we'll hop over with Jared about really what filling in some gaps and the collecting and what happened in the later years of the company. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff to, to happen. Um, I feel like we should say right off the bat that there's some some very unfortunate stuff happening right now with Jeremy um, Berman, who who worked Orange County uh, and it has fallen on some hard times. So this is odd timing that it worked out with this so close to that. But uh, we really, really hope he pulls through and, and is absolutely and is feeling better soon. Yeah. That being said. All right, um, Michael, let's hop over with you, my friend. And let's let's talk about the the origins of the company. And we can kind of do it two ways. We can talk about your introduction with the company, with Orange County, and then also really the origins of it uh, with Daniel Jensen and uh, all that good stuff. So I'll, I'll let you take it away. Well, I moved to Southern California when I was 15 and uh, soon after I got my driver's license and immediately set out to get drum heads and found a, a music shop called The Music House in El Toro, off El Toro Road in Southern California and went in and they really dealt with like rentals, like high school band rentals and stuff like that. So the guy that worked there was trying to dig out heads and finally was like, you know what, you, bro, you need to go across the street to Orange County Drum. They're literally one exit up hmm. across the freeway. It was actually Taylor Hawkins. So he was working, with, he was just a local shaggy haired Laguna Beach drummer at wow. the time who hung out almost every day at Orange County Drum. So uh, I went over there and just as soon as I walked in, it was just like, the first thing I saw was Daniel's massive purple kit with the 24 by 30 kick drum. It was 24 by 30, yeah, 24 by 30, 14 by 14 tom, 16 by 16 floor tom, 18 by 18, and 14 by 14 snare. All purple and black, all peisty black vision symbols, and just a collar lock rack. So it was just like, I was blown away, and I knew like, this is where I'm going to be. So I just pretty much went there every day and just begged them for a job and just pretty much didn't take no for an answer. And eventually they sat me down and said, okay, you can work here, but we're going to pay you $5 an hour, and we're going to pay you in drums because we can't pay you in cash. So I was like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm in. Yeah. So yeah, sat down there every day and started out just like shining cymbals and assembling kits because it was just retail. I mean, they did like a lot of restorations and rewraps and re-edging and did some custom work, but it definitely wasn't wasn't the main thing they did. I mean, it was retail. So it was a shop. Like it was oh, yeah. it was a drum store. We had percussion. Yeah, it was that's why it's Orange County Drum and Percussion. We had a full wow. percussion room, a cymbal room with a sliding glass doors and that was soundproof with all the symbol trees. I mean, it was it was like a, a little retail drum shop, a awesome. badass one. But yeah, yeah. You know? And we dealt with all like the local pros from uh, you could say from like L.A. to San Diego and just, you know, everywhere else. But it was just all the local pros. They knew where to come coming to Orange County Drum. So it was just kind of like a, a local drummer hang. Hmm. Man, so that was what was cool about it now. So that's kind of your introduction into the, the company and everything. Now, I'm sure you know a little bit more information about. Um, so Daniel Jensen is the founder of the company, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is can you correct. give us which Daniel is a busy guy. We've uh, I've, I've tried to get there's a lot of Orange County employees. And like I said, it can be a little bit elusive. Sure. But he, he he drum techs with Travis Barker and a few other people, right, that are very. Uh, I believe so. I, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but I know he was with Travis forever. OK, so, so hard guy to get nailed down but that being said um i think you you guys he wouldn't mind if you speak for him a little bit and kind of say say a little bit about the back history yeah i mean i i can really just speak on what i went through just okay. that time that i was there up until probably 2006 you know i was i started touring full time in 2000 so i would just when i would get off tour i would go back there i'd always fill back in but uh that's when jeremy and those guys were really really doing it holding it. it down 
Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some, but I was there like for the very beginning, like all the no doubt stuff, the three eleven stuff, the early food fighter stuff, really when the origin of the company was starting, we were really working out the edges, working out all the marking, the badges. That's really when other than the shark tooth lugs and a lot of other designs came in later on, like yeah. all the hybrid shells and all the crazy stuff started coming in that, that happened later on. But really we, the origin really happened at, at uh, Lake Forest on the Lake Forest location. Gotcha. And now what year would you put that at as like, is the transition from like a drum shop to a like, to like the brand that we all see with like Travis Barker and like, like becoming <clears throat> like, well, a- it started to happen. It started to happen in Lake Forest. That's when we got 311 and no doubt. And that was really that Chad was our everything at that point in time. Yeah. He was our main guy and Adrian obviously too. But, uh, yeah, that was the, the main thing. And then when Travis came in, Travis still was with the Aquabats when we were dealing with Travis in the very beginning. You know, it was a, uh, you know, it was a, uh, it took a while before and then he got with Blink. And so Travis in the very beginning wasn't our main guy. So that really, I would say, you know, once 2000 hit, you know, late 90s, 2000s, gotcha. once he got with Blink, then that, that's when that whole thing really started. And that's when I kind of started going on tour. So I wasn't around the shop as much at that time. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah, that that man, that's just like that. Um, Orange County was like the perfect. I mean, 311 Blink-182, no doubt. It's like a special time of like those bands of like in Orange County is just so much a part of it. And I remember there was an, uh, um, an issue of Modern Drummer where they were doing a Travis Barker giveaway and he had like a yellow Orange County kit. Or something, and it was like I just remember drooling. I have the flyer over right behind me. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was like <laughs> iconic as every kid and adult was just looking at it, going, "Oh my god, yeah, man." But we, we were at Lake Forest, yeah, and then it was time to move, so we moved into we moved all the equipment into Daniel's garage. That's where I was living at the time. So I was living downstairs. He had the master bedroom, and his mom we got, it was living. It was one big house at the time. Wow. So that was our, that was Orange County drum. That's John would come, he would drive over every day and we built, they built a, a router booth, a soundproof router booth right in the garage. Hmm. And that's where we did it. So as we're going here, can you also mention, cause I think Orange County has, has employees who have gone on to do other awesome things. And it's just kind of like a, yeah. it's just a special, like in general, it's like one, it's like a TV show where every single actor on the TV show went on to do other awesome <laughs> Things, yeah. you know or they I, don't, I, don't know about, I don't know about yeah. i don't know about every actor but yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay so so let's go maybe through a little bit continue with the timeline here but like also just mention like some some names and what people were doing um along the way sure well john was daniel's partner and he, they worked at west coast drum that before orange county drum that was a another local drum shop retail store did restorations and rewrap same thing and they uh, they worked with another guy, Nikki. At this is back in the late '80s, and that's when they decided Daniel hit them up, and they all started Orange County Drum. I don't know if it was '89 or '90, and that's I I got in with them. I think probably maybe a year or two years after they started. But uh, and then Nikki was the main builder. I really learned a lot from Nikki. He was the one who really showed me. Nikki was the main builder back then. No, that's good to know because I was going to say these drums are they're not just. F- flashy cool looking unique drums they're also famous for how they sound and the craftsmanship sure so well it, yeah. it, when it first started it wasn't nearly as flashy i mean we were doing we were wrapping a lot of drums and just straight laminate um, a lot of plastics we were doing satin finishes and we would send out for high gloss but there was no badges um the edges were different they were being done quite differently back then and they weren't that wasn't the main thing they weren't doing nearly as much custom work i mean they were doing some but you know, it wasn't the main thing by any means. And slowly it just, once we got badges and we started getting more and more people playing them, or I should say Daniel got more and more people playing them, then, uh, yeah, that's when it really started taking off. Yeah. And that's when, as soon as we got Chad and Adrian, that's when it started to change. Well, it's like, and then we went to the garage and then, uh, once we were in the garage, I forget, maybe a year and a half, two years, we were in the garage, I think. And then that's when we moved into Santa Ana and that's when some, we got some other, that's when Jeremy came in. I think Jeremy's one of the first guys that came in. I believe so. Gotcha. That's got to be a good feeling to be. I mean, it's a it's a classic like business story. You kind of you 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 expand and you get bigger and you move into a bigger shop and you grow. Sure. And I mean, these are not cheap drum sets. I'm assuming that the 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 quality well, it went the price up. Went the, yeah, 
The price went up throughout the years. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've got old price lists. I've got old price lists back when we were in the garage. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. <laughs> People still wish they were that price. Oh, um, you know, man. Yeah. I remember pricing one out. I mean, I was like 13 or 12 years old going to the website. <clears> like, let me look at how much one costs. It ended up being like a $6,000 drum set. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Never mind. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, I want this option. I want that option. Yeah. yeah, which but they're they're worth it. So, all right, let's let's. So we're at Santa, the Santa Ana shop, and um, like you said, things are becoming more and more flashy because it really. I think Orange County is really a predecessor of like brands like like SJC and these boutique brands where it's sure. really the blueprint of like the flashy. Let's. I, I agree, hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, I, I will say, like you know, we, that stuff had started in Lake Forest. We were doing vintage snare drums. We were doing the a lot of the offset lug configurations. A lot of that stuff was already being done. But uh, the newer guys, once they stepped in, Jeremy, Max, and those guys, they really were starting to do some stuff that was really they took it up a level. So I mean, I got to give props to those guys. I, I, I can I was there for the origin of a lot of the stuff. But then when I would get back off tour, like the stuff that I was seeing was just like. And then I was actually on tour with Angels and Airwaves. I was Adam's drum tech, Adam Willard's drum tech. Yeah, that's when Jeremy was really, the, the stuff that he was sending me out there was just like awesome. Like the hybrid stuff, the metal wood combinations. I mean, then they started doing the hollow bodies. And I mean, just the, the stuff that they were doing was above and beyond. I mean, I was kind of there for a lot of the cool stuff, but it really, they just took it to the next level. Yeah. Once I was yeah. out. Well, yeah. it's it's an interesting thing too, because this, it seems like the type of music began to like i don't know like like uh like no doubt that kind of ska feel and these pop punk bands like things started to get cranked higher and the vented snares and sure. all that and the thin the littler toms yeah it just became like a, a thing and like the jelly bean kits and all that right. stuff so like i don't who who knows if if orange county was like really if if the music scene was determining how you guys were building drums or if the way you were building drums was having a, a an effect on how things were sounding you know what i mean like which one came first well i think maybe a little bit of maybe well ah uh, you know the sound it was just the sound in that in the mid 90s 311 when i when 311 came in the mix chad snare sound was really kind of that really shook things up yeah. and in my opinion at the time people were freaking on chad's snare sound yeah. so it was really a good time it was a really good time for us to pick him up and, and it really kind of, I think, defined our sound. Same with Adrian. I mean, I, I say Chad a lot because, you know, he's a such a badass drummer and he's such a creative mind behind what sure. he does. But, uh, yeah, but that whole sound, I mean, it was really, that was just what was happening at the time. And it really, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think probably, yeah, yeah. I don't know what which one came first. A little first. bit of both. I don't know what came first. Now, it... Yeah. To me, again, looking on the website, you obviously had your major mm -hmm. label players and stuff, but you can't really a business can't run just on making drums for like three mega artists. So at that point, you guys were also like custom oh, yeah. shop making things for everyone. Oh, we were, yeah, we did more work for regular people than we did for artists. I mean, at least at that time. Yeah. And I think that's probably how it was even towards the end. I mean, they were always selling I mean, especially towards the end, I'm sure internationally much more. Yeah. But yeah, it was always selling to the masses. Yeah. Now, was there usually a long wait time to get a drum set in, in like the heyday of like everyone, everyone wanting an Orange County kit? Was it like a year out typically to get a kit or how did that work? Jared could probably answer that more. I mean, back when I was I mean, it was it wasn't too long, but I'm sure probably towards the end when I wasn't there, I'm sure it was probably more like that. Yeah. I'm sure. I don't, was that how it was, Jared? Yeah, I mean, it kind of varied. I mean, I remember reading things anywhere from like, you know, six to eight months. I know cats would order a kit and then immediately put it up on eBay and try mm. to get a price out of it. So people didn't wait. And then I knew that's probably why they sold out every time at the NAMM show. That's um, interesting. Because people were just like, you know, that's the flashiest stuff they had. It was, you know, like a candy shop and people were just grabbing it because especially international. And I think that's why. Some of the craziest rare Orange County yeah. stuff typically mm. ended up overseas. Right. Like that's usually when I'm collecting stuff. That's usually where I find the wow. What is that? Jeez, I've never seen that's it. interesting. Right. Um, they come over from Japan yeah. and just buy it up and take it home. Yeah. Uh, well, obviously Japanese culture. They're very big into American culture. That's kind of their thing. But oh yeah, some of the most ridiculous drums. The like their hollow bodies that I was referring to. 
Mine mm. came from overseas. Interesting. So. Made a long trip away to come back <laughs> to you. Yeah, I've been right. to some of the, like the, <laughs> the drum shows, yeah. and you do see, you hear the rumor of uh, like Japanese collectors walking around filling up a container of stuff to send back uh, because of the market there being so, uh, oh, yeah. you know, right. hot. Yeah, they do it with guitars or anything else. They would buy the, the top of the line stuff, buy, buy full booths, and then just send it back over there. Yeah. And- yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, the, the wait times, I guess, varied between, you know, what it is you ordered because they had different tiers. Like, uh, I remember uh, if you looked at their layout, it would be like type one would be like standard laminates. Type two would be like, you know, satin stains or just um, or natural oil stains. Then like type three is when you start getting into the uh, the crazy paints and uh, sparkle glitter this, wraps this would and be, stripes. This would be considered a type three right here. This middle. Okay, behind you. It's just like a yeah. He's got a yeah, it's a know, veneer, a pur- a purple stained quilted veneer. Got it with a high gloss. The one he's got the straight above would be like a type five, which is like a plaid wrap that's been painted and all that the you know stuff that you would typically see. So I guess it depended on what tier you ordered, or if you ordered offset lugs or powder coating, whatever you ordered, I guess would dictate how long yeah, it took. Yeah, that's interesting. You said powder coating because one thing I think I learned about powder coating. Because of looking at like Orange County, like like rims and I, I, <laughs> before that, I was like, I mean, as a kid, I was like, what the hell, powder coating? Uh, but now, but I knew because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I knew I wanted it. That's <laughs> also for me. Yeah. It was like I'm sure you can remember this. You would see the whatever color the hardware was. Say it was lime green. They would also have like a matching badge for it. And for me as a kid, I thought it was the yeah. coolest thing I'd ever seen. Yep, hands down. Like wait. <laughs> what because i'm used to like you know i remember growing up looking at like old ludwig's like ah who cares about ringo you know what i mean and then you see this yeah what it's almost in a way uh it's it is and it isn't but it's almost like like a like it's defying against the traditional american brands which we all love the ludwig's and the slingerlands but it's like it's like Mm -hmm. here's something different this is our generations i mean this is you know i feel like people born in like 80 90 this is like the it screams like early 2000s. It's like this is different. This isn't a 1960s drum set. This is like this is our special thing. Well, you know, at the time when we when I first started working there, I mean, there was really not there was pork pie. I was talking to Jared about this, but there wasn't really anybody doing anything that crazy. I mean, it was still drums were coming out of the 80s, so it was still the metal scene was still going. There's still big power toms. And Queens Reich was still banging on the radio. I mean, it was still it was still transferring over. So Orange County Drum really came in right. They kind of were. They kind of found their own little niche at the time, I yes. think. And that's why I think a lot of companies that came after them, you see, uh, they started kind of a trend. Yep. So it's like, yeah, I, in my opinion, they're kind yeah. of one of the first ones. Yeah. If not, well, I don't want to say the first, but one of the first ones. Yeah. To get in on that. Yeah. I mean, we've learned, uh, we've learned from other, I mean, I've learned from watching other episodes. There's sometimes this parallels where you figure out like, who's the first to create, uh, acrylic drums and simultaneously yep. you might have five or six people doing it. I don't want to say orange County was the first, but, uh, yeah, when you come to think of it, I think there might've been only a few cats doing custom stuff. Orange County. Well, there was, I had, held I had hole. never seen, I had never seen a big hole in a snare drum in my life before. Daniel came up with the idea to put a idea to put a hole in a snare drum, which I mean, it came from a yeah. the idea of a of a a Ludwig Coliseum slotted snare drum. But you get that has to be eight inches, ten inches deep. You got to have high tension lugs on it. So the idea was kind of get that concept, and you can put on any size drum, just put a big hole in it. So yeah. before that, I'd never seen that idea. I mean, it was so just an example. Yeah. I, I think the Orange County Drum innovated that, and it's and it's yeah. form, and um, it's form that you see like it as a large absolutely hole. which i all right so that's a topic we got to talk about is vented snares because i mean <laughs> like let's all right so this is we're on youtube as well but let's let's maybe for people driving in the car describe you know if someone hasn't seen or heard of a vented snare either one of you guys uh what what is it what's the point of it you kind of explained a little bit about the history of it talk about vented snares you want me to take it jared I'll take my take on it. Um, I mean, you're the, um, I credit him for coming up with the 20 ply shell, but, uh, essentially a vented snare. When you think air vents on a drum, most typically have one air vent and it's only about a half an inch. Some are like three eighths. 
the vented snare that he's referring to are big, large holes, two and a quarter or two inches, all the way up to four inches. And there's typically, depending on the size of the drum, anywhere from, you know, four to, I mean, we've seen, I've seen stuff, a yeah. hundred vents on a snare drum, but uh, a vented snare is basically a snare drum with holes drilled into it. And it, um, it's very dry, very loud. I would say you get more of no the low, uh, not, head sound. No low end. It's not warm. Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's kind of a, unfortunately, uh, I, as much as I love the brand, I feel like it is it is a very one trick pony. But um, I think what did it for people is just the sheer volume and the, the ghost notes and the snare, because you hear a lot sure. of the snare. Well, it, the inside, like the inside said, of the snare of sound out. just goes out. So, like, if you're looking at the side of a vented snare drum, you're looking straight in at the at the underside of the snare wire. So it's literally just projecting straight yeah. out. So it's just a really exaggerated snare sound, yeah. basically. And it looks cool. And then, yeah, it does look cool. And I think uh, the timing of it. I think a lot of artists um, and uh, uh, maybe producers kind of got along with like uh, I would say like Limb Biscuit, Stained, those big bands when they started to make a break. I think they really started propelling that you know what i mean wow these things get some crazy sounds because or like i think one of the most iconic ones that people remember is um deftones when you hear abe anything off white pony you hear that snare sound yeah you can't forget it yeah and i mean collectability yeah. wise i feel like it's like uh you know people who are snare collectors would want to have one because it's kind of like a what is that you know like i i need to have and but you said there's a hundred on some where i've seen that where it's like swiss cheese I think I think the one we did had I think it had forty two holes wow. I believe I think it was a burgundy satin finish but that was on Lake Forest it was one of the yeah something like first that. ones we did and it was just Swiss cheese like you're talking about construction wise is that just get a you know a, a round get like drill it out drill it out I'm sure there's some more precision to it but what would the construction process of something a vented snare be like yeah just drill it out. Just- <laughs> Drill, drill it out, and uh, there's a yeah. tool that they use to to sand it, uh-huh. sand it, and it, basically just we when we first started doing it for the first few years, I forget how long everyone was hand drilled, hand filed, and then hand sanded. What you have to start on one half, work the half, go from the inside, and flip the drum over, do the other half, mm. and shape out the flares inside and out. But it was all hand filed and hand sanded, wow. just all the way to the end, and then hand lacquered, and uh-huh. then another tool came in later on into the mix that really kind of streamlined it, made it way better and way faster. I think uh, Bart can also agree with me um, as a kid going to either local shows or like, I'm sure every kid has tried to drill a hole because of Orange <laughs> County in their snare drum in some yeah. way, shape or form. And I'm sure probably many, I'm sure probably many of them went straight <laughs> um, all the way through from the outside and blasted straight through the inside without stopping yeah. coming back through. Yeah, I'm sure the amount of butchered drums Orange County is responsible for. <laughs> responsible for. Um, every kid, I'm sure, yeah, has or tried. terrible wraps. Yeah, that, that uh, are not I remember, real wraps. Right. They're like laminate, like uh, uh, that you're just kind of put on there. It kills me how many Orange County drums that people decided they wanted to rewrap and refinish. It's just beyond me that like so many of them. I mean, Jared tells me stories, and so many people are just like, I want to rewrap this. I added more holes to this. I did this. It's like, yeah, so many of them got ruined. I think they also don't understand that, like, in the grand scheme of things, Orange County is so still relatively small, and the number of drums that they pumped out, I will grab, uh, I'll collect them, and I get one, and I'll be like, huh, this one's a weird one, I've never seen it before, and I'll ask somebody who used to work there, come to find out, like, oh, well, that used to be Dave Grohl or Taylor Mm -hmm. Hawkins from their side project, and I almost refinished it, you know, things like that, so I always tell people when they're, I get hit up all the time to get asked, uh, hey... I want to redo this or I want to, I do it more on it. Do you, does it need to be like, is the wrap bubbling? Is the powder coating things bent or things not working? I have nothing against that, but uh, to take a perfectly good finished drum and change the color of it. Yeah, exactly. Get a different drum. But by nature, Orange County is a very like customizable brand. So I guess the people who are buying them like to have custom customized things that are really unique, but I guess it's different if the original brand is customizing it. Well, it's like it's like buying a vintage car. It's like buying a vin- having a vintage car or a vintage anything and completely repainting it, putting new bumpers on it, changing the interior color. It's not original anymore. It's not. It's you've totally killed its yeah. value. So the most valuable vintage anything is the ones that are all original, original paint, original condition, 
preserved, yeah. you know, that's always going to draw the most yeah. money. Let's hop back on kind of going through the history of the company a little bit more with. So we were at Santa Ana, just just checking in about how many drums Orange County was really producing like in a day or a month, like how many drums were being cranked out? Um, Because these, again, are like hand built drums. These are not mass produced. What was uh, maybe at its heyday? What like at the prime, like 2000s? Is that fair to say that that would be the like? What would be the peak? I would say, yeah, I would say mid 2000s. Okay. How say, many yeah. drums were mid-2000s. being cranked out a day? Drum sets, snares, whatever at its peak. Well, I can't speak too much on it because I was, like I said, I was really touring a lot at that point in time. Early on, it was more like I would build a snare drum from start to finish. I would cut, the, I would cut it out of the tube, do everything all the way to the point of assembly. And that's really how I like to build drums. But, you know, that's, you can't do that once you start really cranking them out, that's just not yeah. what you can do. So when I started coming back in the 2000s, when I would get off tour, when I would go back, it was getting more more of a, not mass production feel, but a little bit more of a, a factory yeah. type Assembly of... Assembly line. They had, I would go back in and they just had me, yeah, they just had me doing vents. I would just sit in there and just grind out vents and vents and vents. And that's just, hand me a snare, just do the vents, pass it on. It's just all I was doing. And I, and I wasn't enjoying it at the time. I was complaining about it, I'm sure. <laughs> But, uh, but that's the like, yeah, I just, but it was getting more like yeah. it had to be like that. I mean, that's the way it goes yeah. in any company. That's that's you got to have departments yeah. and that's what you do in that department. And that's and they started getting more. But it wasn't ever fully like that. But it was I mean, I don't know what they were cranking up per day, but they were definitely moving a lot more when I was going yeah. back later. Jared, any insight on that? Because I'm sure you've followed like serial numbers and things like that of ironically I, I guess enough it, um well, they yeah. don't really have serial yeah. numbers <laughs> oh that's good to know so okay, that, never mind. that's the other thing is i was about to say is it's almost i've tried because i've been asked this before and i'm sure even if you would ask daniel or anybody else who was there for a very long time i don't think anybody knows the answer to how many drones no, were actually yeah. made <laughs> it's kind right. of a guess um yeah i there because again like Mike said in the beginning, they didn't even have badges on the drums. It wasn't really, I don't think, thought out that way. Like, oh, yeah. we're going to be doing this for quite some time and it's going to take off. So they literally just had a local trophy maker make badges. Everything was always local to where they were. Yeah, his name was his name was Lou. And I, I honestly, I can't speak for Daniel, but I honestly don't think when Daniel started Orange County Drum he realized what it was going to become. I don't know. I don't know if he necessarily had the the vision to say, this is what, I mean, maybe he did, maybe I'm wrong, but it sure. definitely seemed like it unfolded as time went on. I mean, I think he was just yeah. wanted a badass local yeah. drum shop flying by the city of you know, pants yeah. and wanted to work with John and Nikki and he was young at the time. So I'm not sure if he realized yeah. what it was, what he was creating, but, uh, it definitely unfolded into that. That's what I mean. I'm sure it was an afterthought to be like, hey, let's put yeah. serial numbers on these. If somebody calls or wants to match up something, right. you know, I don't think they thought that far ahead because I can't tell you. I mean, just when I think I've seen everything, somebody will post something for sale and I go, where was this thing hiding? Or like, I've never seen that. Not that they'd had catalogs and they had, you know, their website, but they weren't very... Um, it wasn't like internet was now where you have to post every day on social media on like yeah. Instagram, like your latest build or something. I think they were just pumping, not pumping, but um, rolling yeah. these things out, not really thinking, oh, well, we should have taken a photo of that too late now. Um, so I you're, don't think you're just working and working yeah. and working. Yeah, at the time, at the yeah. time I mean, I don't think it didn't I'm, seem like you have a number. I certainly didn't realize that it was going to be what it became. I mean, when I kind of found that. Orange County Drum Group on Facebook later on, like I was kind of shocked. I was like, wow, there's people that are this into it. And like, it's a thing. Like I just, I was out of touch. I kind of was going through my own thing for a long time. So I just wasn't, I didn't know what was going on with the company. But yeah, at the time, back in the early, late nineties, early two thousands, I certainly didn't realize that it was, that it was something that was going to be iconic and that was going to be, people were going to be talking about probably forever. It was going to be part of drum history. No idea. Yeah. No idea. It yeah. is. It it one hundred percent is a part of drum history because it's like it's just its own category. Um, and and going back real quick, we were talking about. Uh, it's cool to know that it was like a trophy maker because that's how you. That's oh, how like was a go- local. 
Yeah, that's how someone would go and make like a little bat. Like my a buddy of mine makes up trophies with like funny like things on it that he gives to people at like, you know, some like beer pong game or something. But like um, you go to a trophy shop. Who designed the logo? Well, Daniel and those guys had the, the O, the C, and the D, and the P. That was them. I'm not sure. I'm sure probably Daniel and John. Yeah. And those guys. Because it's iconic. Yeah. I mean, that, on right. the front of the drum set, that like how right. it all fits into each the other. Circle, it's, yeah. It seems obvious now. You go, oh, these letters all kind of Russian doll into each other. But it's like, you know, that had to take some thought and some designing. And uh, it it is it's cool. It fits. I don't know. It yeah. feels I California. Think at that, if at that, that point in time, so Daniel, so Daniel so was so really the visionary yeah. behind the whole thing. I mean, Daniel was really, really into it. That was his life. That was his passion. And uh, he's really... He's really the reason why they got the people that they did. I mean, he's he he's got the gift of gab. So he, you know, he really got out there and he's the one that got all these artists and got these people to be into his company. I mean, I, I give props where props are due. I mean, he really kind of it's really yeah. he's the one that kind of generated the whole thing, turned it into what it was, you know. Also, yeah, just maybe yep. back up a little bit. So in regards to what we were talking about with the local trophy guy and same kind of thing, I don't think Daniel might might have thinking along the lines of, um, you know, hey, it's going to be this massive company, but everything was like, oh, powder coating. We got a guy down the block who does that. Yeah, uh, Lou trophy was, maker. So Lou was right next door. Literally, like he shared a wall yeah. with us. So you walk out our front door and you walk into oh, Lou's wow. the trophy shop, and we just went in there and said, hey, can you engrave us some little beds? And he was like, okay. And then actually, this this right here, when we were designing them, we uh, Daniel and I were like, how big can you make it? Like what's the biggest size you can make? And he's like, Oh, I think I can make it like six by 12. And we're like, make us two of those. We need to just, and so I kept one and Daniel kept the other. And that's, that's what that is. Yep. And to describe for the audio folks, he's got an awesome, like a jumbo badge. Yeah. It's like a plaque. If you're listening. It's a badge to end all badge. Yeah. (laughs) It's like a plaque. It is a plaque. It's a trophy. (laughs) Yeah. But uh, for me, like that was the cool thing. And, Later on, as people asked me to restore these things, I found it so fun to go down and track down where they got these things. Like you would see, um, like a Louis Vuitton snare drum show up on uh, from Orange County. You're like, where, why? And then you'd find out, oh, I got this at the Fabric District, or like, oh, this um, this guy was a local painter. There was always something. So for me, it's always trying to find track down like the uh, the original paper trail to try to keep it more authentic. You know. Yeah, and if you and if the, and I was telling Jared, yeah. I was telling Jared the older drums, if you were to take off the badge, you'll see the file marks. Lou would after he would trim them and cut them, he would take each one by hand. And he would file the backs, file off the burrs. So if you take off the old badges and you wow. see file marks, that's from Lou. Wow! Did he do? We'll get to the like later. It sort of it turned into something. The company turned into something different, like Guitar Center and all that. But did did Lou with the trophy shop? Did he do like all of the like? custom shop ones or did that did that change at some time to need to be he did he did all all the stuff at lake forest all the 311 stuff all like jared's got some of the badges like he's got it he did we did alien head badges we did crop circle badges (laughs) i mean we just do because chad was literally like i want crop circles on my drums i want aliens on my drums and we're like okay like i think the alien head was an alien workshop sticker he gave us it was like a skateboard company he's like that's the alien head i want so we literally just got the logos and brought them to lou and he made a digital image of it and engraved it. So that's, he was just doing them next door. I don't know how long Lou did the badges. I'm not sure. Probably at the end, he wasn't doing them. I'm assuming, okay. but yeah, like, like Mike saying, I'm not sure either. Um, I do know that there is like a sh- certain error of when like the spacing of the holes for the badge changed slightly. And I don't know if that's just the idea of being handmade from a local trophy guy and they just that batch was different, or if it's they had switched to somebody else. I honestly don't know, but um, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure he yeah. did the badges until the company didn't make custom shop anymore. Yeah, I don't know. Lou, Lou was Lou was really old, even in the late yeah, '90s. Lou was like in his 80s, so I don't know. I don't know. If <laughs> yeah, Lou, I don't wow. Know. I don't know if Lou was making them towards the end or not. Yeah, so that's what I mean. We don't. We don't know. Yeah. And, and I mean, it hits a cost prohibitive thing. That's why brands like like at some point you get so big that you have to order a bag of 10,000 sure. from, you know, Taiwan or whatever, sure. which I'm not sure. Yeah. Happened, we, used to, but we used to get them. And Lou would give them to us. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep interrupting, but you would fine. give them to us and toilet paper and he would put one, fold it, put another one, fold it, put another one. So we'd wow. get them in these like and then put a piece of tape around it. So we'd go over to Lou's and we'd pick them up just these little stacks of badges wrapped in toilet paper. That's how we Man. got them. Crazy. Yeah. 
I just love that. I mean, it's like it, you're making drums for some of the biggest drummers in the world, but I guess that's that attention. It's just like this cool, like just dudes is a good way to describe it. Making these drums. You know what I mean? Again, it's like SoCal guys making drums. It, it's a, it all has a vibe to it. Everything. Oh, yeah. Well, at, the, at, at Lake Forest, like I mentioned, we had a, we had a rehearsal room that they did lessons. They did drum lessons. So we had like several instructors that did lessons in there. So we'd have kids hanging out in there doing lessons. And like Taylor came in one day with a cassette tape and he's like, dude, I got to audition for this. Like he couldn't even pronounce it. Swear to God. He was like, Alanis Morris. I don't even know, bro. But he, he literally <laughs> sat in there and rehearsed for Alanis Morris set for like a month straight. So I was like wow. building drums, listening to Taylor slam out the parts in our little rehearsal room. Like it, it was just a local hang for all. The, I mean, every like lunch was a, a was a deal. Like everybody would want to eat lunch with us. So like any given yeah. day, there would be like our whole workshop would just be full of drummers all place Chinese orders and send somebody out to go get it. And it would just be all That's sitting awesome. around eating, eating food, talking about drums. So it was, for me, it was a dream. Job. That's a special, that's like a special time in history for you guys, for everyone involved there. We're like, I mean, you guys are young. You're sitting there. It's the, the cool spot to be. Things are going well. You're making money doing it. The, the company is, I mean, that's just like, yeah. it's like lightning in a bottle. Like, and it seems I'll like be, you I'll appreciate it. Yeah, I'll be honest. I think of like yeah. the Lake Forest location as like the the where it all started. I think that's if I were to ever go back and like want to go visit a location, I would go back. I mean, I would see them both. But to me, the Lake Forest location is special to me. And I think that's where really everything that's where the fire got started. That's where it really ignited. Yeah, to me. Hey, guys, this episode is brought to you by Twin Cities Drum Collective in Minnesota. They make six five one drums played by Dave King of the Bad Plus and Dave Watt of the Motet. They have a rock and drum shop, and they invented an ingenious product that drummers rave about, Hoop Protect. Pretty much all of us have gunked up bass drum hoops from failed hoop guards. Well, Hoop Protect slips right on with no adhesive and provides the best pedal grip you'll ever get, and it prevents or ends damage to your hoops. Danny Carey from Tool has three on his set. Ronnie from The Killers bought 10 for his Craviato collection. It's brilliant for anything hoop mounted, and it's an easy buy for only $11.99. Go to tcdrumcollective.com to find it or follow them on Instagram at Twin Cities Drum Collective where you can get it from the link in their bio. Hoop Protect, from the makers of 651 Drums and one of the coolest drum shops around. Hoop Protect, get it today. It's interesting too, parallels of like like Ludwig, Ludwig and Ludwig in the very beginning. I think that was a drum shop. The two, the the brothers, that was a drum shop. Drum workshop was like, like that was, you know, lessons and things like that. It's like these, some of these companies start with like, we're going to do all this stuff. And then they, they, they find their, their special thing that they're good at. And then like, it just happens naturally. You know what I mean? Like, well, we're going to make right. more making drum sets than we are as a retail shop. Uh, so a lot of parallels to other historical companies yeah the, the retail was obviously you know with guitar center and everything yeah. else it just got to the point where the retail was just not not happening yeah. so uh and the custom thing was really starting to become what it was so yeah yeah so i'm also wondering and and this is like one of those questions that i think everyone out there wonders and if it's something where you don't want to answer you don't have to but like do drummers like in the prime like like adrian young chad sexton Travis Barker, did those guys pay for their extremely expensive, nice drum sets, or was it more like no? He, here's not your drum at that set. time, not not yeah. the big guys. No, that was actually a little bit of a a thing because you know the vice president John was really doing the books and was doing doing all the ordering and doing everything, so he was a lot more like trying watching the books and watching the money. And Daniel, as I said, he likes to you know. He's out there trying to spread the company and spread the love and show people and check out my drums. So he was very generous. Daniel was extremely generous with his drums to the point of John would be like, dude, what are you doing? Because like, he would just give them out. Like I would be on tour. Like I was on OzFest 2002. I did 2000 and 2002. And on 2002, I literally made a drum for almost every single artist on the main stage. I went to every single person, Mike, uh, Mike Borden, uh, John from System, uh, who else, Jared? I went around literally like, what do you want? What color do you want? Oh, uh, oh, oh yeah. Uh, we, uh, we had a list uh, of this. Johnny mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I went around literally to each artist and was like, "What? I, I'm going to make you a snare drum. What do you want? What color do you like? What? Da, da, da. And then I would just call up the shop. Make me this. It's from Mike Borden. I want this, this, and that. And literally within a week and a half, boom, I just give them a, a, 
an address to a venue and it would just show up. I'd walk on the docks and be like, here you go. So I literally gave away, I was given away. Like if I ever called him up and be like, there's an artist I'm on tour with that want to give him a snare, they'd be like, okay, here. Yeah. So every time I probably gave away seven, 10 snare drums hmm. on tour. Yeah. So yeah, if it was a big artist and they were into it, boom. Definitely. Well, it worked out. I mean, but like, that's like, you need both sides. You need, like you said, John, who's like, you, you got to stop versus like Daniel, where it's like, we're well, no, we need to get this out. We wouldn't be here if I mean, you're not going to catch a famous drummer by saying, we're going to sell you the snare. It's two thousand yeah. dollars or whatever. I'm sure it wasn't that expensive, right. but like, but like you, you get them and then yeah. someone else sees what they're playing and then they want to order it or like <clears throat> Travis Barker on MTV, like it's history. Dan- Daniel, Daniel literally went to a 311 because we were. He had fallen in 311. We ever we all fell in love with 311. But he actually went to, from my understanding, went to a, a 311 show. And when the show was over, Yeti was their drum tech at the time, Chad's drum tech. And uh, Daniel had a snare with him and got Yeti's attention and was like, hey, man, I want to give this to Chad. And he was like, you want to give that to Chad? And he was like, yeah. He was like, hold on. And he just walked back, grabbed Chad from the dressing room, and he walked out. And Daniel was like, here. And Chad was just like, what? And that was the beginning. That's That was it. I mean, he just showed up at a show and was like, hey, I want to give you a snare. And that was, that's what did it. Man. And that's what Danny would do. He would just show up and be like, we want to give you a snare drum here. Yeah. Have it. Mm. Put your name on it. We engraved your name on it. Kind of like the, uh, kind of like the old days of, uh, you know, the salesman's going to uh, door to door after two drum shops back, like, you know, no social media. I'm sure they had nobody really call in the shop to order drums. Yeah. They just walked up and yeah. was like, here you go. Yeah. That, was what, that was what it was. I think that, uh, that really kind of set, that really helped set the vibe too, in a way, you know? You have to build your own. It's like you're building your own like um, like uh, reputation of like, and then you can say, oh, this drummer plays it. Oh, that drummer plays it. All right. Well, now I want to play it. Oh, well, he plays it too. So now this drummer plays it. It's just building and building and building. But it seemed like it happened fast. Well, I think when Chad, I think when Chad started playing the drums and got so into it, there was so many drummers that just looked up to Chad. Chad was at that time and still, but at that time when he first hit the scene with 311 hit the scene. It was just kind of like people were yeah. freaking on Chad. So when we got Chad, it really leg- legitimized Orange County Drum. I mean, it was like it made, you know, we really started to get yeah. on the map at that point. Yep. And yeah, and like the the timing of it, like I said, uh, like it said in the beginning, a lot of these guys, Chad, I'm sure, and sure with uh, no doubt, they were just local bands. You know, that was the local drum shop just making drums for local drummers. And then fast forward when they started making the break. It just happened, like, you know what I mean? The timing just happened to work yeah. out where, like, oh, yeah, we made drums for Chad in a garage before, you know, these massive records came out. And then the rest is kind of history. And, and Daniel and I were also doing the doing albums. So we that was a big thing of what we were doing. We were, uh, we would, we would go in the studio. So we'd build the drums and they would call us, hey, can you bring them in the studio? So we'd oh, go cool. in the studio and tune. Um, we did, did uh, No Doubt, Tragic Kingdom, did... 311 blue album 311 transistor that's awesome so uh yeah that was that was a big part of what we did is studio going in the studio and actually tuning the drums getting getting tones you got to be everywhere you got to do everything i mean you guys were were uh absolute hustlers at it where you're just going hard and and you know i feel like when people are younger there's not much like you have less responsibilities you have less yeah. Well, da- Daniel was really the driving force behind it. I, I was, I got fortunate, you know, I, I moved in with him. I lived with him. I, I got a job there when I was 16, but I moved in when I was 18 at his house at the garage. So, uh, but he really, he was really the driving force behind the whole thing. I kind of just was a tag along. I got to be a part of the whole thing and I kind of made my mark in my own way, but Daniel yeah. really was what really drove the whole thing forward and, and really all the artists, everything was really, Daniel was the one that really made it all yeah. happen. Now, let me ask, so let's fast forwarding back again when things were like total, like, I mean, the, all the drummers are great and huge, but like Travis Barker is even to this day, I mean, he's on, I mean, he's with the Kardashians and stuff. It's mega. Yeah. So was there a point at the peak of like Orange County madness where things were starting to like get out of control for you guys, where it was like hard to keep up with the demand and like, like, this is crazy. How do we, how do we do this? Where you needed some like business help or anything? Did it ever get a little like, whoa, like 
we're uh, over in over our heads here? Um, again, I, I can only speculate on this. Uh, don't hold me to this, but um, the way that they had set up their business model, I'm sure you remember from looking at the website back in the day, you could essentially price out what your kit was. What they would do is they would say, okay, for us to start your kit, we need a 50% deposit. And then once it's done, we get the 50%, you know, the remainder. Um, unfortunately, that business sure. model, was I, I feel, was more like you got to rob Peter to pay Paul kind of vibe. So what would happen was my deposit would cover yeah. somebody else's. So I think they kind of got wrapped up in getting backed up in waiting for parts or things. And also because a lot of things were outsourced, like the super crazy paint jobs or the powder coating if they quoted a customer X amount of dollars and the painter really stuck it to them, it is what it is. Um, so I think there was a lot of issues with that. So yeah. I don't, I, I think maybe it got overwhelming as far as that, but, uh, again, I was not there, so I do not know, but, yeah. um, there was a little bit of that when I was working there. I mean, it was always, there was, there was times we would have to steal parts off other yeah. snare drums to complete other snare drums. I mean, this is, this is way back in the day. So, I mean, it was always, we were never business first. I don't think any one yeah. of us were ever like good business people. I mean, it definitely like, you know, at least speaking, Daniel was, I'm not going to talk about Daniel, but uh, yeah, he was sure. really all about dealing with the artist first and foremost. Yeah, yeah. And John really kind of was running things business wise for the most part. I mean, obviously they were collaborating, but, and I think probably they could have used at, at many times, probably could have used a really good business person, but yeah, I say that, I'm, you know. No, and I, I say that completely out of respect of like, you guys are musicians and it's just interesting to have like cautionary tales of like what did happen where even with the podcast, like I make some money off advertising and Patreon and I've never documented in a single month <laughs> okay. how much I've made for any month. I just keep moving forward. And it's like, we're all in the same boat of like, I should probably be tracking this uh, <laughs> at some point, but. Oh yeah, you, you do a gig, I have no exactly. idea. Like, I guess they paid me that or maybe it came from that gig, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know, man. You guys are it, it, it's it'd be it'd be odd if it was like, oh no, we we all had you know MBAs and we were yeah, um, it was just all a bunch of drummers and musicians. I mean, John was a bass player, John's a bass player, and uh, so it was just all a bunch of freaking musicians in there just doing what we love to do. So it wasn't it wasn't business first, you know, from what I know. It it also kind of goes back to that theme we had said earlier of just like flying by the seat of your pants and just figuring it out as you go. Like, um, Michael has told me countless times, dude, I did not know this was going to be what it is. Yeah. Like it had this mark. Um, he's like, dude, we were just a bunch of drummers bullshitting in a, in a yep. garage. And then it's now this, you know, some of the, in my opinion, like the Holy grail totally. of drums now. Um, yeah, it's just and, weird. Uh, it's pretty surreal. Yeah, like they weren't really, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't, Hey, let's be business minded. Cause we're trying to make this last 30, 40 years. We're going to go public with, um, stock markets and things like that. <laughs> like, no, it was just, nah, man, just make the drum for the guy down the block. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Which maybe it wouldn't be as cool if it was like that, you know, if it was and, exactly. And was we were say, just doing kinda, stuff that was just, yeah. I mean, it was just kind of a cool because you could just sit around and just think of crazy ideas. Like let's do this color combination or what if, like I was, I was one of the first ones. I think maybe the, the first one to say, "Hey," because I was learn how to do inner hoops, reinforcement hoops. So I was doing those with Nikki, and one day I was like, "Why don't we take a whole ten ply shell and trim the whole thing and pound it inside and make one thick ass shell?" And I remember John laughing like, "You've lost your f in mind." Like he laughed at everything. Like you guys have lost it. He thought me and Daniel were freaking crazy at everything we did. But we did yeah. it, and I had it, and it, we got it so loose. We actually had had a huge gap. We filled it in with. He took wood glue and mixed in sawdust with it. It didn't look good, but it was the very first one we did. And I wrapped it in this ugly purple color, which actually was from the same material <laughs> roll from that, from Daniel's purple kit that I told you about his original, huge, massive purple kit. And it actually got stolen at a POD studio session. So I don't have it anymore, but it was number wow. one. It was the number one first 20 ply. So sure. yeah, Jeez. that sucks. I will yeah, find he, it. Jerry yeah, Jared's me on find it. it. <laughs> but I think it was an inside. Yeah. Jo I think it was an inside job. So I'm pretty sure it's sitting in a studio right now. Probably one of my Probably. boy studios. <laughs> Man, with a towel over it, just to, like, hoping no one no. looks at no, it. No, probably just sitting right out in the open. No shame. But <laughs> yeah, I mean to to go off of what Mike was saying too, the idea that they could just make these crazy, you know, ideas and just whip them out. I think it really. Um, 
kind of turn the industry upside down from all perspectives of other drum totally. companies. Like you have the American brands like Ludwig had was kind of in disarray. Slingerland didn't exist. You really only had a handful of like, you know, DW wasn't the mecca of DW you think yep. now. Um, Bill Depmore was still just same thing, probably like you guys just in a garage at his house doing this. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of um, American brands. It was mostly Japanese and imports and just this is the drum set. This is the color. This is what you order. This is what yeah. you get. Drums were always very traditional and nobody had ever really like taken it and just flipped the whole thing on its head. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what we did. I think that's kind of what we were oh, yeah, the first people sure. to take drums and just do some just things with them that nobody had ever even thought about doing. So I remember, you know, as a kid, you would see, um, you know, well, here's a Pearl kid. You got these big mounted toms on a kick drum. And then you see Orange County with these double ported bass drum heads and yep. flashy colors. Next thing you know, Pearl's like, we do custom. We have a master's works yep. or uh, DW's like, oh, we're custom. We'll do short stack toms. I think they started realizing, oh, wow, I think these guys are onto something. Let's take that idea and roll with it as well. Yeah. Jared, I'll tell the story real quick. I was on tour with POD. I was on tour with POD and love. I, I gave him, he had five Orange County drum snare drums and he played two of them. His side snare was a Rasta snare, red, gold, and green sparkle. And they had a black and red, black with red powder coated hardware snare, both six by twelves. And Derek from Pearl, the rep, he hated it. And Pearl hated it. They were like, so we were on tour with Lincoln Park. And he came to the show and he was like, Mike, you got to, you got to get him off these Orange County snares. He was at the time, he was one of Pearl's, if not Pearl's biggest guy. And he's like, so we want to make you some snares that we want you to play. So we're going to make you some reference. So we're going to make you some thick shell snares. So we actually were the first ones. He made us two twelves Pearl reference with the, with the thick shells. Love was the very first one to get those. The very first two. I don't even think he has them anymore, mm. but those were the very first two Pearl. Pearl had to copy it. Pearl was like, literally like, we're going to make you thick shell snares so you'll play them. So you'll get rid of, stop playing the Orange County snares. Man. So that just shows you that at that yeah. time, big, the, Pearl was the biggest company in the world, Brook Drum Company. Yeah. So yeah. they were like, we're going we're gonna to do and that. And now I think they still make those shells to this day for the reference snares. Man. So, yeah, true story. And uh, I mean, they start doing crazy things like that to try to play catch up. Like, oh, wow, somebody's taking, you know, a market share. We need to get on that. And then I think they also... Not even just the, the flash finishes and thick shells. It was also just, at the time, Mike would tell you, you built a drum from start to, to end at Orange County, hand sanding everything, lacquering it yourself. There wasn't really a drum at that time that had that many man yeah. hours, I guess you would say, or that much love or an intention put into it. It was just, it's hot off the press, it's wrapped in this color, and it's shipped yeah. in a box overseas yeah. to you. You know, yeah. I think it really started making Pearl and DW and other guys start going, okay, we need to really work on quality control because these guys are killing it and yeah. we're not. Well, that's I think they all started to realize that there was a new generation of drummers and there was a new generation of drums. And they were always, for so long, they would, like I said, it had always been tradition. All those companies had always followed the tradition. So once we, we kind of shook up the whole tradition. Yeah. So that's when companies started to take notice. Like you can't drill holes in these things. You can't mount it this way. Like, sure yeah. you can. Powder coat. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, wait, it glows in the dark. Why would you do Man. that? I'm like, why not? And I cannot be the only one thinking the parallel between with uh, Wub from POD loving the snare drum and Buddy Rich and his iconic five snare that he would he would not let go of. He would always have his in and oh, yeah. end and they would get so furious about it. And they'd say, no, you got to play this. And, uh, you know, if you're a big, big drummer, you can pull some weight and you can play. I- ideally, you can play what you want. Well, I'm sure there's probably certain yeah. levels once you get to a level where you're getting paid money yeah. and you know, you're a paid endorsee, then you've got a contract. Yeah. I'm sure that's, that's something entirely different. Yeah. You orange County wouldn't want it to go the other way where they're playing someone else's snare. No. And then you're like, well, what, what the fuck are paying you? Yeah. 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 So, um, all right, let's keep moving forward and we'll kind of get closer to the end of it. But I want to ask while we're in this heyday, maybe this question goes to you, Michael, for, um, you know, the orange County guys who were there in the day, like, was there a moment that sticks out to you of like, like Travis Barker on the VMAs or something like this of just like, holy crap, we have made it like, like a, the pinnacle that you think back on of like your happiest memory of like, all right, the company has made it. Is there anything that sticks out to you in that era? Well, you know, I mean, honestly, probably in the years when things were really the biggest with Travis and all that stuff, I really wasn't around. So I can't 
I think that was probably when they were at their peak. Okay. But for me, you know, having at the time having Chad, Adrian, and Taylor, yeah, from Foo Fighters at the time, yeah, that was really for me. That was that was the coolest thing. I mean, I think the company went on to have more success and and more popularity. And I I don't think I was around. I don't think I experienced that as much. But for me, it was just I always look at those early days when when the when everything was cultivated. That's to me that was the most special time, and I'll always yeah. If, when I think back, if people were to ask me, like, what's the most special time in Orange County drum history, I wouldn't say the later years. I would say the early years. Okay. Just, maybe that's because I was there. But yeah. that's when everything really, that's, by the time we got to Santa Ana, everything was established. I mean, it was, they were cranking yeah. by the time we got to Santa Ana. So yep. I really think the Lake Forest location was, was when the, or, the origins of the company, that's when everything was really yeah. laid Special out. Special mojo yeah. going on in that, like, yeah. stars aligning. So then... Jared mm-hmm. and Michael jump in whenever, obviously, too. But so when when Michael, when you weren't there and when things when when, you know, the back half of the company, Jared picking up here is kind of a collector, restorer, enthusiast, love lover of, of Orange County. What happened on that point? Kind of where Michael's time there and not. And you know what I mean? I'm sure you're still friends with everyone. Around 2000, around 2006, yeah. I moved out of California in 2006. Okay. So that's around when I was. Out. All right. So then what happens from there? Uh, I mean, some of this is documented. Some of this is just my perspective. Um, so I think a combination of in 2006, I mean, um, at that time, um, Blink-182 was no longer. They were on their hiatus, had broken up. And uh, Travis was doing, I think, a lot of DJ stuff and other things. They had plus 44. So I think as the main endorser, I think, you know, um, that slowed up a little bit. Also, you start looking at... Um, Daniel and other guys like Mike and guys who were around the shop in the beginning, like even Jeremy, they were now out on Mm. tour with other people. So you didn't really have the, you know, the guys in the shop like that, that used to be there to really hold it down or buckle it down. Um, And I mean, um, let me just say one thing real quick. In my opinion, it it really would have been good. Daniel was busy and I, obviously he was doing his thing, but I think if Daniel had been able to be around the shop more and be more hands-on with it, I think possibly things could have been a little different, but you know, he really got, got caught up in what he was doing so yeah. it was all being run by other people you know he wasn't able to you know he wasn't able to sit down there and really run it yeah. directly probably the way he should have i think it could have been better if he was able more sure. but whatever carry on Jay. Yeah, good, good, good point yeah so no yeah he makes the point but yeah uh, essentially there's that and then just so many factors that were piling up um you had a lot of um, quote unquote custom builders popping up overnight, it seemed like, and they were taking not also the just, you know, the idea of the ported heads. And I feel like I saw a square badge on every drum for, you know, 10 years, just trying to the double ported bass drum heads, just really trying to cash in on the Orange County thing. And people were kind of taking the yeah. business model as well. Um, you look at that, you also have outsiders, you know, that I'm sure we're probably maybe not the same quality of work, but doing it cheaper, making the same kind of vibe that you could get. Hey, you don't want to wait eight months from Orange County. I'll make you one. And then you have other, these other companies sprouting out. Then you also have, um, you know, the, uh, the economy that, that essentially I think did them in was the, uh, the housing market. Yeah. And also, and also I will you know, say a lot yeah. of those also, factors. also just music industry in general, the music industry just has slowly been tanking throughout the years. So, I mean, I think Orange County Drum got in at the very end when the music industry was, there was still an industry there, but slowly it was fizzling out. And not only that, but just drum trends, the drum sounds have changed. I mean, you're now it's all about fat, warm snares. It's like those nineties cracky snare drums. You don't hear that anymore. It's literally like, it's an old sound. Yeah. I mean, it's like some people still are into it. I still like torque snares, Yeah. but it's like thick sound, thick shells and vintage snares and slamming the rim and torquing them up. It's like you don't really hear it that much. It was kind of a it was kind of a phase in drums. Yeah. It was kind of a trend. So that kind of went away, yeah. and then the music industry changed. All the bands started changing. So I think that also that affected every company. That affected anybody that was involved with the music industry at all. So I think the music in, music in general yeah. changing was a big factor. Yeah. Well, also I think it ties with the uh, the like we had said, business wasn't exactly first priority. Um, you, you know, the business model wasn't exactly the best, and then. Like you said, you have one guy just trying to do the books, and I think everything kind of had just caught up with them, and it just 
I don't think they really had a way out other than the option was to sell the yeah. guitar center. Well, and and it's been mentioned throughout this, but most of the guys who worked there though, like like Michael and Jeremy, like you guys were all like working touring with other you're working like techs and drummers and you're 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 on the road. I mean that that's kind of what makes it so special is like it's four drummers by drummers, but then when everyone is like peeling off and going and doing their things, I guess it's it's not as focused when people aren't there. Like sure, you're saying, sure. Well, that area yeah. at that time, Orange County at yeah. that time, it was just the hotbed. That's where it was all happening, and and there were so many bands we were dealing with, so it was just constantly. I mean, getting constantly hit like, hey, do you guys have a drum tech? We need a drum tech. We need a drum tech. People would just ask. They would call it John and be like, we need a drum tech. So that's how I got, I was going to the studio and I just got, I was, went to the studio with a band Shovel and they were like, the manager came to me, they liked what I was doing. He was like, do you want to go on Ozfest with us? We need a drum tech. Like, okay. So mm. it was just right place at the right time. And it was just where, where the shop was in Southern California. It was just right there where the industry was happening. Totally. Was right place, right time. Yeah. That's why everybody was getting gigs and you know, it was just, yeah, that was what was up. So Jared, this is more your area of expertise, I think. Why don't you kind of bring it on home here? You mentioned um, the selling to Guitar Center and all that stuff. What happened with that whole that the end, the end portion of the company? This one, uh, it's to me, it's a little depressing because uh, Mike and I both agreed that they should still be around today. People still are seeking the sound, and still seeking these drums. So it's a little upsetting that they they should still be here, but. Um, Basically, uh, I think between the, um, I'm sure everybody has heard about the Guitar Center drum off. Of course. Um, typically, I think the finales were hosted over right in like the Hollywood shop, if I'm not mistaken, mm-hmm. in Guitar Center. So you had uh, a lot of guys there, and I believe Adrian and Travis had done, you know, before playing Orange County Kit. So I think that's where the relationship kind of started between GC and, um, and Orange County. But um, fast forward. Orange County had uh, problems and they were having trouble filling orders. Um, like I said, the business model of, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul, yep. I think caught up to them where they just had, you know, shells without parts or things waiting on the shelf. Orange uh, County was like, Hey, you know, what are we going to do? And I think guitar center found it. Hey, we'll bail you guys out. But for us, can you make us a run of snares? So most people will know there's a USA made run of guitar center snares in like 2008, 2009. I think maybe even as early as 07 started rolling out, um, vented, you know, and real flashy. And they were the, like, everyone was like, Oh, you know, we see them in guitar center now. And, um, from what I've gathered, you know, the research hand was that, Guitar Center paid Orange County uh, a little bailout, like, okay, we'll put some money so you can fill your orders and you make us some snares as well. And we have this thing going on. But unfortunately, I think they were so um, in in shambles. And like I said, people were not around anymore. It was only a few guys. And then housing market hits and um, the debt was just too high where the only out was for Guitar Center to make the offer. Hmm. to um, buy Orange County. In theory, this sounds pretty good. You know, oh, well, you have a big company like Guitar Center now can take and run and maybe keep Orange County afloat now, but they uh, unfortunately outsourced to an overseas manufacturer just to license the name Orange County, and yeah. the badges changed, the hardware changed, quality is it's not a USA-made kit anymore. It's not, you know, a couple guys in a garage making it anymore. It's... yeah. A mass factory and yeah for me that's uh 2009 2010 and then orange county was just to me done i mean technically the brand still exists but yeah it's yeah. not it's not what it was well that's an interesting point because it like the venice series and all that stuff i mean it's like so they're still making drums for guitar center with the badge on it correct or is it is it yeah, they, they changed the badge from the, the rectangle you see behind Mike's head to now these, like, they try to make it look like the shark tooth lugs where it's just the triangular Are they still point. making those? But, They're uh, still yeah. making those right now? Uh, no, so without diving too much in, careful of the legal aspects, um, I believe 2015, the contract for the manufacturer of those drums stopped, so whatever Guitar Center has in stock at 
their stores or musician friends is what's there. I don't think they've made any since. Interesting. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, they're still technically around, but you don't see, you don't see anything new rolling out. Like if you look at a guitar center, you know, mail in pamphlet or, or the magazines that they have, you don't really see like new exclusive to guitar center. There's nothing really been rolling out in the last, you know, Now, when you see a guy like Travis Barker or someone playing with like Machine Gun Kelly, like a modern, like, you know, something's happening like now and he's playing Orange County. Are those is he playing old kits or is a guy like that still getting custom stuff from Daniel or how does that work? Yeah, a little a little bit of both. I'm sure he also has drums that none of us have even seen, but um, he and uh, he has like on Instagram, he does get show, you know, older kits that he does use in studio and. It also depends on, um, so Mike and I, I mean, I did what Mike did as well. I was a tech on the road for a bit and things like that. So we have what we call backline. Mm-hmm. So wherever city you end up, there's sometimes drums there waiting yeah. for you. So I, I'm sure he's recycled older kits, but he did have some new ones uh, with the, the newer Blink lineup. Um, some new ones made and two, uh, from what I was told, um, Daniel built some, um, Jeremy at Q built some, like even um, Adrian Young, his no doubt stuff when they like did their one reunion mm-hmm. tour that was made by Jeremy. Uh, so Jeremy, um, if people don't know, uh, he also acquired almost all the uh, tooling from orange County. Wow. So yeah. Q is as close as you're going to get to, uh, yeah. Orange I, County nowadays. Yeah, if you ask I, me. I will but, say um, on that one. Um, yeah, I, I respect Jeremy a lot because, you know, in my opinion, if there's one person and I've said this to Jared a lot, if there's one person that should be copying, doing, those designs, the stuff that he was doing, it's Jeremy. I mean, if there's one person that should be doing the old style stuff, you know, the thick shells, acrylics, you know, the crazy plaid wraps, all that stuff. But you know, what's cool is Jer- Jeremy didn't do it. He really kind of carved his own path and he did Q. Yeah. And, I, and I really respect that. He could have very well just kept doing what he was doing in Orange County, but he really did his own thing. So yeah, it's, I think really, in my opinion, Jeremy is the only one that if there was going to be somebody doing an Orange County drum, you know, he's really the heart and soul of what Orange County drum, the, the Orange County drum that people know and love today, all the crazy designs, in my opinion, Jeremy's really, and I shouldn't say just Jeremy, but those guys at that time were really sure. the heart and soul of that whole, what Orange County drum became. Interesting. Yeah. And well a lot of other, also to add to that, um, the Q guys, not even just Jeremy, but a lot of the guys like Max and a few other guys that worked in Orange County, are, so, are still kind of related and still work together with Q and whatnot. So it is kind of cool that they did, you know yeah. what I mean, do their own thing, but still kept it Orange County yeah. family, which I but think not is cool. But not just blatantly but, um, copying Orange County drum. That's no. what I love about it. I love about it. No, if you didn't say that, you wouldn't know. I mean, really, you'd look right. at it and go, this is a different, and it's its own whole thing. It's That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. He yeah. could have he yeah. just copied it. And there's other people, it's been copied a lot, and I don't respect that, so... I really respect that he yeah. just did his own thing. That's what I mean. I like I um I I think if um like you think of um trying to think of like other brands in comparison like Leedy had its time and its error and it died like Rogers had its time and obviously yeah. it came back but uh you think of that like Orange County its error was that and I think the the legacy yeah. is that. You Let know it I mean? be. Yeah, exactly. It would be cool to resurrect it, you know what I mean, if it was done right and a lot of things fell into place, but just let it be yeah. what it was, you know, because I don't think I don't think the uh, the mojo no. and the magic can happen. Lightning, like that yeah, yeah, lightning, lightning's not going to strike like twice. I told, um, I had said to Michael, it's funny how history repeats itself. A lot of the other listeners might know what I'm referring to uh, in regards to like I look at Ludwig, um, you know, especially like as a kid. So you have that uh, generation of uh, drummers that saw Ringo. Like, yes, Ludwig was around, but started making drums again under his name in the late fifties. Mm-hmm. transition badge and then Ringo hits and it just explodes. Yep. And for like 20 years, Ludwig was the biggest names in drums. And then unfortunately they sold. I look at orange County, same thing. Like you had had big endorsers and big guys. And then I, as a kid, from my perspective, you see Enema of the state come out and you see Travis playing these kits, bam, it happened again, you know, yeah. really took off and lasted the same thing about like 20 year run of just pumping out some of the craziest, coolest, looking and sounding drums and then you know same thing just sold the same thing kind of happens to a lot of companies i mean a lot of parallels parallels. even even with jeremy getting the tooling it's kind of like 
a Fibes to like Darwin to um, uh, that those brands where it's Camco like, to DW, Camco to DW. It's like it's like Bernie Stone has uh, the, the Stone or the, the radio the frequency and, show. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of um, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, Quarter. I was going to say Fibes to, to Darwin to Quarter. I don't think that's the right order, but yeah, it's it's yeah, it's a lot of uh, parallels. But I guess we are all drummers are just kind of like I don't know. We we do what we do. We move forward, and we're all cut from the same cloth and kind of do the same. <laughs> we make the same mistakes, you know. <laughs> but yeah. it's it's just a special time, and I think this has just been awesome to have you guys on here to kind of like because. Orange County is a little bit, uh, the history is, I don't want to say it's confusing, but it's a little bit of like, it's been cleared up now of like, it's just, if I had to sum it up, I'd be like, it was just drum nerd, drum bums in Southern California, making drums, going on the road, building (laughs) cool kits. There's awesome drummers around town who were playing them, right place, right time. These drummers get big. It's just like, it all just worked out. No, I I agree. I I think also... When you look at um, the other, I think, big companies like 60s and 70s, like, you know, the big four, um, they actually had, like, catalogs, like Orange County. Like, yeah, it had catalogs, but it wasn't, you know, or even like today, you don't have them. They didn't have the Internet. Like, you think there's not an archival thing of, you know, this is how, like, again, back to, I have no idea how many drums they made. I don't think anybody has a number to that. Um, There wasn't a whole lot of forth off of that. So, yeah, the history is kind of... um, it's a lot of oral history and uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, we'll piece it together. And maybe if people out there know something or want to add something, they can like comment on the episode on YouTube or whatever, or email in and I can post about <clears> it. <throat> um, but it's really cool to have both of you guys on here, both Michael, your experience with the company and Jared, your experience is really kind of a, a, a fan of this. And Jared, you've been kind of really sticking on me about getting this done, which I appreciate because it's like, sometimes you can't, it's like, yeah, like all the time and energy can't go into one episode because there's gotta be one every week. So it's awesome to have people like you who help me kind of like, no, this is who you need to talk to. All right, that didn't work. Let's try again. And Michael, you were super responsive. So I appreciate that as well. Yeah. It's it's a shame that we couldn't get some of the other guys on because there's really a lot of the story that I can't tell. So, I mean, sure. I consider myself one of the original guys, but it's a shame that we can't, you know, you can't get, couldn't have heard from some of the other guys because there was a lot, there's a lot of other perspectives and a lot of the personalities that were involved. Yeah. Like, I mean, going back real quick, you had plenty of guests on like Rob Cook, where these guys, some of these guys are just diehard fans of a particular brand. This was a big part of my life as a kid, you know, without, I don't think without Enema of the State, I don't think I would have even decided to pick up a set of drumsticks. Yep. So for me, this was more not just to get, you know, 10 minutes of fame on a piece of computer. Uh, it was more, I just want to preserve the history and the brand that, you know, has meant so much to me all these years and just really let people know like, Hey, they left their mark and yeah. this is what they were about. You know, yep. it wasn't just, I was hounding you to get an episode. Oh, out. No, it was, not at all. Anyway, think, you're not going to get 10 minutes. People... You're going to get, you're going to get 15 <laughs> minutes of fame from this. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> no, but, um, I didn't get that vibe at but, all. I feel like you, you were very honest and you were, you were even especially like, no, I don't want to do it by myself. I want to be respectful and get someone from the company. So I think it was really cool, um, to do yeah. that. So awesome guys. Well, um, Michael and Jared have been kind enough to stick around for a quick Patreon bonus episode. Um, and what I'm going to ask them about um, once we finish this one up is what their favorite drum set, Orange County drum set of all time was. There's, well, we don't know how many there were, but uh, th- there's a lot of really cool Orange County drum sets out there. So if you want to check that episode out um, with both these guys, which is kind of rare to have two people on the show, I think it's only happened. Uh, Rogers had two and GMS had two. So I think it's this yeah. is only the third one. So you guys are in, uh, you know, you're in special history of, of the podcast. But um, to check that out, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, Patreon link. Uh, click that. You can join up two bucks a month, get the uh, bonus episodes. And I really appreciate uh, everyone who does that. But um, do you guys want to plug anything as we wrap up here on the main episode? Um, start with you, Michael. Anything you're working on that you want to kind of tell people where to check you mm-hmm. out and all that stuff? Uh, I'm actually starting a custom drum company, Kelly Drums. Yeah. Cool. That's actually, I'm, wow. in, my sh- I'm in my workshop right now. <laughs> So I'm getting this all set up. It's going to be freaking oh, yeah. dialed. Awesome. Getting, yeah, it's going to be dialed. I'll be up and going probably in, I would say, another two months maybe. I just had rotator cuff surgery, so that was a big setback for me. But I've used the time to really get myself all dialed. So 
think probably awesome. in another two months I'm going to be doing it. I'm starting out with just snares, but eventually probably start doing some kits. But uh, I'm not going to be copying Orange County Drum. I'll be doing stuff, you know, I mean, you might see some slight similarities, but it's not going to be a copy. It's not going to be a knockoff by any means. I'm going to yeah. be doing stuff that I like. And so, yeah. Cool. Congrats be, be, and good luck. Thank you. You'll be hearing yeah. about it soon. Guaranteed. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Jared, what about you, my friend? Um, yeah, I mean, most people hit me up on uh, Facebook. Um, chances are I'm in a uh, hundred groups for drums so it's jared fallon on facebook on uh instagram um i actually started a new instagram just strictly for drum aspects and that's a uh, ghost note underscore percussion so that's where people hit me up to do rewraps restore things you know new hardware and then i also am going to be building some stuff as cool. well yeah and i mean you're, you're the guy i'm sure all of you guys can do it but i mean i know um, Jared, you're passionate about restoring and preserving and just seeing Orange County drums, which it's just, I'm sure everyone at Orange County, the original crew appreciates someone out there keeping the legacy alive like that, um, which is really cool. So, uh, thank and again, you. thanks to Jared for kind of getting everything all set up <clears> with this over. I mean, we've been talking for a year about plus about oh, easily, this yeah. together and easily. uh <laughs> michael was our missing piece to make this special episode happen. yeah he just hit me up and was like hey do you want to do this and i was like okay so yeah it's cool but yeah we should have done that it probably should have done that a year and a half ago but uh i think as we wrap up though we should say uh we hope jeremy feels better yeah, uh, from q he's going through some serious stuff um there's a gofundme that i think the drum click network uh we're putting things together for a raffle with some with some really cool stuff uh, there's, I don't want to talk too much about it now though, because there's going to be like a separate ad that you'll hear either at the beginning of this that has all the details. So I don't want to say something wrong, but there's going to be a raffle and help raise money for that. But his GoFundMe page, I'll put in the description of this. Um, so check that out. But on that note, Michael, Jared, thank you guys for joining me on this and making it a really cool, you know, double guest super episode that we've been trying to get along, uh, set up for a long time. So thank yeah. you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks Bart.